Welcome to Building Safe Workplaces, a podcast where experts dedicated to workplace health and safety review relevant industry topics. This podcast is brought to you by the Health and Safety Council. Welcome to Building Safe Workplaces, casual talk about serious matters. I'm your host, Tommy Nitt with Hask. Today, I'm joined with a bunch of guests from Covestro. We'll start right here to my left, and I'll introduce Mr. Jesus Estrada. Jesus, if you would tell us a little bit about what you do at Covestro and, and a fun fact about yourself. So I am the turnaround execution lead for the site uh, in Baytown. A uh, fun fact about myself is I like to work on old cars, so including what I drive to work every day. So anytime I go outside of Baytown, I have to take my wife's vehicle because it's got to be dependable. Right. <laughs> so that's a pretty quick little fun fact. All right. Corey? Uh, thanks, Tommy. Uh, my name is Corey Wright. Uh, I work in the HSE department. Uh, really, I would say a fun fact about myself is I do like to ride dirt bikes, um, but, you know, I'm not really that fast at them, right? But I do like to ride them, so I really appreciate that. And then also, I'm um, a Tennessee Titan fan, as you're well aware, Tommy. So tighten There's up. There's got to be one somewhere. Tighten up. There's got to be one somewhere. All right, Tom? Yeah, my name is Tom Lepbrown. I'm the turnaround department lead at the Covestra Baytown site. Uh, fun fact, I try to keep those secret for the most part, so I'll say that I uh, like to travel a lot. Okay, all right. Raj? Hi, my name is uh, Raj Chirakuri. I'm a turnaround manager at the Covestro Baytown site. Uh, fun fact, <clears throat> I've been over, I visited around 35 states, and uh, my, my goal is to hit all the states. Which ones I, are you missing? What's your top one you're missing that you want to go to? Hawaii. Hawaii? Uh-huh. That's a nice one. <laughs> all right, so if uh, by the introductions you haven't figured out what our topic t- today is going to be, it's going to be turnarounds. So you guys have just completed or are finishing up one of the uh, uh, another turnaround that you guys did. But for those in our audience who may not understand what we're talking about when we use the terminology of turnarounds, uh, Tom, why don't you tell us a little bit what what is a turnaround? Define a turnaround. If you had to, if I said Tom, what is a turnaround? What would you tell everybody? Yeah, Tommy. So we work in a chemical plant, and so in the chemical and refining industry, a turnaround would be a strategic business event where we choose to take down our production units for a specified time period to do a a very important scope, which could be cleaning, inspections, repairs, implementation of important projects to try to improve the safety, reliability, and operability of our production units for multiple years going forward. So it is is basically like a controlled outage that you plan ahead of time and that you, you have a laundry list of jobs that you can't do while the plant's running and you shut down to take care of all those, right? That's right. That, that's a great way of summarizing it. And when you say start early, we usually start a year and a half to two years in advance. Mm-hmm. And the event we just completed had roughly a thousand individual jobs across six production units Wow! to give an idea of the scale and compl- complexity of such an event. And how many people are involved in, in, in an event like that, Corey? I mean, in this last turnaround, how many people did you see come into Covestro that maybe were not there on a regular basis? Okay, so Tommy, one thing that we do use, we use external resources to actually come in. So, mm-hmm. uh, But what we would normally do is we're looking at our ex, you know, resources, right? As you know, that's always a challenge to get resources when you got uh, a lot of our other companies that are fighting for the same resources. Uh, during our peak time of this one, we had about 1,100 individuals there at the site uh, that were external, right? And, right. That, and then we also, you have indirects. You know, of course, those are directs we're talking about, and also you have indirects as well. Okay. Uh, so that's a, lot a, of, a lot of people coming in that we're not really familiar with it, certainly. That's got a plague on your logistics, right? Yes, sir, especially when you start looking at infrastructure, right? Infrastructure is very, very important. Hey, you know, if, if anybody knows anything about Cabestro, we're a two-lane town, right? You got <laughs> one lane coming in, one lane going out. And so, you know, we've got to look at where they're parking, hey, how we're busing. You know, time on tools is very important. Right. So in these turnarounds, what what other challenges are, are you have? Hey, Seuss, what, what, what kind of things happen in this turnaround that, that make it such a special event? Well, I think one of the things that really – 
challenge us in every event that we do, uh, similar to other facilities when they go on their turnaround, is we probably do a really good job planning original mm -hmm. scope or all the known things, right? We pretty much prepare. We can ca we can have the quantities in place. And it starts like what we were talking about a little bit ago, logistics, infrastructure, those kinds of things. I think the biggest challenges is are the unknowns, right? Uh, as we start to get into equipment, even though we, you know, by the time we open it and clean it and inspect it, we might have some major discoveries that uh, – where there might have not been indicators from the last time we went into it or even while we were running. So I think that's that's probably our single biggest wild card because you never really know until you have it all open, you've gotten into all the major equipment to find out, are you going to find something mm -hmm. that is going to probably jeopardize this timeline? And that's discovery work, right? That's discovery work. Yeah. So – what else? I mean, what else? What makes that turnaround so difficult? Raj, you got something that, that – what is your biggest challenge on the turnarounds? It's a sheer volume of people in the site and coordinating. It's, it's chaos, mm -hmm. but it's organized chaos. Organized right? chaos. Organized that's, chaos. That's what I've heard explained a lot of times, a turnaround is organized chaos. Organized chaos. Yeah. And it's little things, right? It's things that you don't even think about, like bathrooms, right? 1,100 people. It, that's that's tremendous and you, you you know you you plan for these jobs and everything but there's so much other planning that is involved in a, in an actual turnaround to bring that many people where are they going to eat where are they going to take their breaks where i mean so much it's, it's 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 quite overwhelming at times and that's why you start obviously a year and a half in advance right and we do put a lot of effort into the planning for the logistics and infrastructure in order to support that number of people right as you mentioned if you have a site that normally has two thousand people on it's uh, premises, you add another more than thousand, you have to have the facilities to accommodate that and you have to plan ahead and set that up and, and be prepared. Not okay. just to support them, but their tooling, the equipment they need, everything. Right. Okay. So why? Uh, so, so we know what a turnaround is and we know all the challenges are that are on a turnaround. Um, what, what makes it successful? What do you consider a successful turnaround? If you had to define what is good, what is bad, what makes a good turnaround, what makes a bad turnaround? Corey, you want to? Well, you know, Tommy, we go by three uh, major KPIs, right? You know, mm -hmm. of course, safety. Safety is our number one priority. Uh, so we want to keep everybody safe during these turnarounds, right? So, and in, in like you we talked about earlier, it's been said quite a bit of times, we have a lot of people that haven't never, hey, have they ever been to a plant before? Have they been this, have they been that? So you got to look at a mentor process, those type things as well, right? So yeah, safety. Right. And also budget. Right. We always, you know, money, money, money. Right. Mm -hmm. We also got to talk about the money part. And are we giving it back to them in time? Right. Like I think Tom mentioned a while ago, you know, when he was defining the turnaround, how long we're going to be out. Right. Well, and then on top of Jesus's comment. Right. We've got 42, uh, say, 42 days. Right. Say 42 days that we're going out for this particular um, event. Well, we have to give that unit back in that, that amount of time, right? So those three KPIs is something that we normally look at, right, to kind of define what's a successful versus non-successful. Mm -hmm. But also, like, you know, hey, look, how's it going? Hey, what, what's our lessons learned from last time? Did we learn anything right. as well? Okay. Yes, sir. Like what you hear so far? Make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you and our generous sponsors. Thank you for your support. Now, back to the show. So on this last turnaround that you guys completed, what were some of the major uh, challenging uh, things that happened on this last turnaround? Would you consider it successful or would you consider it not as good as you could? And, and what are those challenges that made it may, maybe were factors to not make it as good as you could? Hey, Seuss. Well, I think if we talk about challenges, there's always going to be something out there, right? And if we talk about a, an event like this, of this size and magnitude, uh, the list of challenges could could probably just, we could be here all day talking about them. But if I were to probably categorize them by size, mm -hmm. uh, another one that I would probably put at the top of the list, and a lot of it's it's just our industry now. And we it's something that we've known for a while. It's labor, right? So the labor shortages 
the and it's not just the amount of people, but qualified people. I think that's the mix, right? To being able to to identify which resources are you really going to be hurting for. Sometimes you have some indicators up front, but a lot of times until you get into it, even numbers that might have been might have been com, uh, committed and we might have felt we were okay, until you get into the uh, I guess uh, the thick of the storm, you won't really know exactly who's not coming to work, who's not going to make it, right? Mm -hmm. And and then, like I said, sometimes Discover plays a role in that because uh, depending on what you unveil, right, you might not have somebody that can come in and, and handle that specialty, right? Okay. And, Corey? And, and, and to touch up on what Jesus was saying, right, uh, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, is, is like, you know, we got to find the resources, right? 1,100 people is 1,100 people, but are those people qualified to do the job that you're asking them to do? And then, you know, being in this industry and being where we are, right? On, on the, the Gulf, Gulf on Coast. On the Gulf Coast, yeah. right? As you're well aware, Tommy, you live on, on the Gulf Coast, is that we're fighting all the other chemical companies, refineries, and those for these resources, right? Right. And then also to, to add to that, what he was saying, though, another issue that we saw was the supply chain, right? Everybody else is having to deal with that as well, right? Are we getting the material? Are we getting it on time? You know, that's why that pre-planning goes uh, so many far months ahead. That's, a, that's an interesting uh, take you had on, on the supply chain because, you know, we see it across every industry, right? Uh, take the automotive industry. Trucks, cars right now are, are tough to come by. Uh, things like that. We, we're seeing shortages uh, across the industry. Even office furniture, when uh, we were doing an expansion here, we were ordering a desk. They were telling us it was about eight weeks out just to get a desk. I mean, it's, it's insane, right? And so I can imagine on a, uh, a facilities level where you guys are trying to bring in so much material and stuff for this turnaround, it's, it's got to be pretty hectic as well. Yes, sir. Right. Especially when you come to exotics, that tell me, you know, some kind of exotic material, something like that, that's specialty. Yeah. Tom, what did you see? Well, I'll just expand and then uh, on what you just said. When you talk about materials, you have to have the right materials, the right part, the right specification at the right time. And, uh, you know, I was told a long time ago that in real estate, the three most important factors is location, location, location. And in mm -hmm. turnarounds, you could almost say it's materials, materials, materials. Because even if it's not the most qualified craft, you can usually find somebody who can do the work. Right. But if you don't have the right materials, you simply cannot do the job. You, you can't substitute a, a, a round peg for a square hole type of situation. It mm -hmm. has to be right. So, so that's an extra challenge for us these days. Yeah. I mean, if, if, I think they've already done a good job talking about, you know, we had at least one contractor company that overcommitted mm -hmm. uh, what, 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 what number of resources they thought they could provide. Materials provided a challenge as well and, you know, caused us to come up with some plan Bs and, and get creative at times. You know, I, I would say in general, it was already touched on, the biggest challenge is off. one of the biggest challenges is usually the unknown discoveries that you find. You have equipment that's been running for, in our case, five years. And you know, perhaps the unit's been running well, you don't have any indications, previous inspections of previous years were fine. You haven't opened this guy up for five years, sometimes more. You anticipate what you can, we think we do a good job at that, but oftentimes you can get caught off guard uh, by having much more damage or different damage mechanisms than you expected. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had at least two cases of that where the findings were beyond anything we anticipated and, and that caused long uh, rebuild times or, or repair times. Okay, okay. Raj, what about you? What is, what, what in this last turnaround, what was some of the more challenging things that, uh, that you noticed? Tommy, I think uh, what Jesus and Corey and even Tom mentioned, there's one element that we always have a challenge is sticking to the play. Mm -hmm. That's what we call as a schedule. Right. It's always a challenge when we go into these aging units where this discovery is pretty significant. You have had a play that you tell, okay, you, your contractors should come and you s stick to the schedule. But whenever there's a discovery that throws in a wrench, now, okay, what do we do? Do we go chase the discovery? How is it going to impact? You know, how is it going to impact your, your next work? So right. it, I think that, that is been a challenge. Um, and, and I think it, it, even in the event, it was not as bad, mm -hmm. but certainly that is one of the things that we, we see that in turnarounds as sticking to that schedule or play. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, could, that could be pretty challenging because time is money, right? right. Uh, if you don't get the unit back up in time, then you're losing several millions of dollars a day 
as, as the unit's down. So, uh, you know, and everyone has somebody to report to, right? So the, your, your report you're up and they're saying, hey, when is this going to be done, right? Yeah. So, Jesus, you said something earlier, though, and I, I want to circle back around to it, and, and it was quality of people, right? Um, and, and I can imagine just in our industry, like I said, you guys are all from Covestro and you had this turnaround, but you weren't the only plant on the ship channel, as Corey alluded to. There's many other facilities up and down the ship channel that may be all having turnarounds. And typically on the Gulf Coast, we see two major times a year where we see turnaround season, right? And that's January, February, and then September, October. Uh, everyone, no one likes to work uh, long, hot hours outside in the summer in Texas. And, of course, we cannot interfere with deer season or Christmas because that's, that's un, unheard of. <laughs> that's, that's sacrilegious, right? So we can't do that. So, uh, so finding those, those craftsmen and those people to work has got to be pretty challenging, right? So, so what, are, what are some of the things you guys do uh, as far as to, to find those people? How far in advance are you letting people know? So the way we're set up, we try to have five-year contracts with our major turnaround contract partners. Okay. What that does is helps to establish a relationship that, you know, as we plan our turnaround several years in advance, these same companies are trying to plan their cruise availability several years in advance. And if we know we're going to be partners for five years and ideally more, mm -hmm. if, if we, you know, extend or go beyond or renew, then you develop a relationship over time. You can learn your lessons together as you go and by being able to commit to these companies early they can get on their calendar to make sure that their key folks will be available at the right times and they have an, a way to anticipate total numbers we're going to need and uh yeah be able to plan in that direction the other factor one other factor that we uh, do is actually try and treat the contractors well right right you know we talked a couple times earlier about logistics and infrastructure and you know if, if you give you know sufficient uh, uh, facilities for people when it comes to parking, lunch facilities, break area, clean restrooms, these type of things, then th that goes a long way to creating the conditions that people want to come back and work for you again. Mm -hmm. Because certainly they remember the places that did not do this for them, and they're less inclined to be able to, to get the uh, people. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. And, and I want to touch up on what Tom said, right? He talk, made a broad key word that I like, relationship. Right, building that relationship is so key, right? Because, like you said, you're starting off on a foundation, right? You got to start off with the, you know, the building blocks right at the beginning, and so as that foundation keeps getting growing, it keeps growing, right? The more relationship that we have with that, with our clients, our partners, what we want to call our partners, right? Yeah. Because we're on the owner side, right? The owner side is a little different than the contractor side, and you want to treat them really well. You do. Because you want them to want to come back to your right, right, back to your facility. They have choices, right? Exactly. They have choices. They do have choices, right? And there's a lot of money out there flying around for them to, to, to grab, right? But that being said, we want them to want to come to Covestro, mm -hmm. and that relationship is very, very key. Okay. All right. Um, so, what, what role does leadership? go to meeting your goals and the, your, you mentioned earlier the, the KPIs, the safety, uh, uh, time, and, and, and the uh, budget. What, what key factors does your leadership in these turnarounds really play into that? Well, leadership's where it all starts, Tommy. Leadership is where, where it begins and where it ends. And I kind of use the analogy all the time is like, hey, look, uh, you know, if I didn't want to be you know what my parents kind of brought me up to I look that, that was that was bred in me how my parents kind of set the tone for me and my relationship with this world that's kind of how it is same thing with these crews same thing with these contract companies that we have right their leadership sets the tone for how they're going to come into our facility how they're going to uh, do the work as we expect them to do the mm -hmm. work and then how they're going to do it you know we talk about safety all the time right but i believe uh, efficiency leads to safety right mm -hmm. so the more that we're pre-planned and all that stuff with the leadership and that's leadership's health that, that starts that okay tom what do you think about it well when you talk about leadership i think about there's leadership at all levels from from our you know site management through our team through the contract partners down to the foreman who's trying to lead his crew to execute a job at this moment and we really need everybody 
being on, on the same page, knowing what is our strategy and goals, communicating together to make sure we're executing that and sharing information back and forth as needed, and uh, to feel accountable and feel, uh, let's say, responsible and part of this overall process, trying to achieve a safe and efficient turnaround together. Right. Right. And, and sometimes, you know, leaderships don't always have title, right? Because I, we, we always like to say that some of the best leaders are the actual the people that don't have the title of leader, right? They're, they're, they're workers in your crew. Uh, I like to say anytime you get more than two people together, a leader will emerge in, the, in that group, right? And so if you have a crew of 10 people, uh, you may have two or three leaders that emerge in that group that are really, that really stepping forward for you. So um, a lot of times we, we think of leadership as someone who is the titled, but a lot of times leaders are just naturally, they step forward. There's someone who takes that ownership and the responsibility and step forward, right? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so how do you address leadership? Do you guys in your turnarounds, did you see you're bringing 1,100 people in? How do you facilitate leadership to those those 1100 people are you using your in-house people for all your leaders or is there the some of those 1100 people coming in leaders how, how does that work for for covestro raj well covestro has um, the turnaround department mm -hmm. right you have all the key leaders you have um, turnaround managers you have department leads and now that funnels down it further funnels down to your contractor leadership. Mm -hmm. So then you have your contractor leadership. They bring their project managers, superintendents. It goes further down. You have your own um, contractor foreman, general foreman, leaders like that. Right. But at, uh, at the, I think every at the at the highest level, you still have your covestro leadership, and then you start duplicating uh, contractor leadership similar to the covestro. Uh, Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, Zeus, what do you think? Man, leadership is something that <laughs> I can speak on all day. I'm passionate about it, man. I, I think it's it's more than just a word, right? It's right. really a movement. Mm -hmm. And like Tom said, leadership is that it can exist and should exist at all levels, right? Uh, but I think a lot of the what we you know. A lot of the ways that, that we that we uh, pretty much make sure that leadership is being, you know, displayed and 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 uh, and done at all levels, right? Is we partner up with, with with our contractors, right? And it's not just our contractors; it's leadership in all departments, mm -hmm. right? And so, in a typical turnaround, we have so many different departments that come together. Right. So that's and this is a typical I use Raj's uh, word tree mm -hmm. to other facilities. Right. You have operations and engineering and you have so many different people that in some ways it's their agenda or their responsibility. Right. But it has to bridge together. And in an event like this, that relationship is really is very, very important. Right. But I think leadership and, and how we handle it on site is. You know, one of the things, I, and I guess I'll speak on how I, sure, uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, demonstrate leadership, right? It, it starts a lot with, with having uh, certain values, right? It, leadership tells me what I will tolerate, what I will allow, what we expect. And so, and, and that's, and we, we carry that through with everybody, right? And, and, how, and how we treat each other, right? Some of the things that, the, how we support each other, right? Because a lot of things, words can mean nothing mm -hmm. if they don't take action, right? right? And I actually have a quote in my office that says, I cannot hear what you're saying because what you're doing speaks so loudly. Right. You see what I'm saying? So it's not just enough about speaking about it. You got to do it. And that's how you really earn the trust at all levels, right? So we say, hey, we're not going to tolerate certain behavior then let's not tolerate right hey we're also going to reward and, re and recognize this type of behavior well let's reward and recognize mm -hmm. and so those are some of the things that i mean we would never be any better than the team that we have and that team is 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 made from everybody in all the levels working together uh and and really kind of being the backbone to each other yeah 
Okay, so, you know, I, I'm going to kind of steal something from Tom, right? We talk about a uh, orchestra, right? And that's what this is. It's an orchestra, right? And uh, Jesus just alluded to it, that there's leaders in all levels, right? And, and even Rosh is something, right? You've got the top cavestro levels, right? they got to say, hey, look, do we have enough supply to give to our customers, right? That's one of the first things you got to depend on, like, sign off on before you actually make shut this unit down right and so it kind of starts there you know and as we start funneling down through this leadership right you want to make sure that as y'all said the, the leaders kind of they stand out they stand out well they might not have that designation as leader but then all of a sudden it kind of comes across that way and so i just think the more that we like i said mesh and kind of get back to tom's uh, analogy right we have a orchestra right you got some in the percussion you got some playing the 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 trombone you know all these other things right but to make that symphony sound good right they all got a mesh and that's where leadership really if you have good leadership that will that will so it sounds like leadership is a huge key for a success or failure of a turnaround i would think too communication right absolutely i mean with that many people i can only imagine what even simple communication has got to go through, I mean, if you've ever played the, uh, in, in school, you ever played the telephone game, right, where you take one message and you try to pass it through about six people, by the time it gets to the end, it's something totally different. I, I think that, that that's got to be a challenge as well. What, what are some of the things, you, uh, I mean, what are some of the challenges you've had with communication? I mean, is there, is there how do you address that, that issue? Oh, it's a huge challenge. And uh, I, I probably wore myself out in this last turnaround saying that over 90 percent, Jesus heard us 100 times at least. <laughs> He's laughing. Oh, <laughs> you were going to get me to say it. I, I should have let you. I, 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 I was going to, to say, hey, Tom, going to set him up. As you can it, tell, huh? Tom says a lot. A lot. I say a lot, but I, I very often say over 90 percent of our challenges and issues during execution is caused by communication or lack thereof. Right. And so that, that's the tie there to the leadership what was mentioning and the tie into Corey's analogy of the symphony or the orchestra you know we, we need all these leaders at all different levels of the organization but we have to have them going in the same direction we have to have them with the same goals the same uh, uh, maneuvers there so the way to do that is you mentioned these different sections of the symphony or uh, have them aligned and one of the alignment tools the same way that the uh, symphony would have their sheet music that they've mm -hmm. been practicing on and they know how the uh, music's supposed to be played, that goes back to the schedule. So we really try hard to have mm -hmm. the schedule updated, dynamic, reflective of what's going on, which means we're keeping it current. Let's say we constructed it correctly up front, right. but then as we go, we're keeping it timely updated, making adjustments where we need to. We're bringing in additional and changed work as needed so we all have the same sheet music we're trying to play to because we can't to use what Corey was using. The, the trombones can't be on a different tune than the percussion, or else it's right. going to be really hard to listen to. Yeah, yeah. So when you when you bring someone in uh, from the outside and say uh, contract X con contract company X Y Z is coming in and they're bringing in their leadership, how do you how do you get them on board with your your way? You know what I mean? The the Covestro way. How do you how do you kind of onboard them? to get to where you guys are all synchronized? So, you know, we like to do what we call workshops, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something big. You want to kind of bring them in to kind of get to know them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I kind of use the, you know, one of my things is like, hey, we're sitting at a bar having a drink, right? Yeah. But let's kind of get to know you. You get to know me. I get to know you. I get to know your strengths, weaknesses. You, I'll, you know, you'll get to know my strengths and weaknesses. And we that's where the expectation is set, right? You want to set the expectation. And that bar needs to be set very high Tommy so you know setting that bar real high you've got to bring them in early and I'm not talking about the management that we're going to have you know at the plant site mm -hmm. I'm talking about the management that's paying their salaries right 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 so you know I think these workshops help quite a bit then we kind of do these risk workshops and these kind of things right to, to add on to that and then also you know like uh, you know setting the behavior right set the behavior up front and uh, then kind of build upon that, like we were talking about already. Build those partnerships, build those relationships, and uh, you know, and then expand from from that way. We're like Tom made the five year statement, right? That's the whole purpose of having the five years, so we can keep consistency. Right, like consistency. Okay. So, so Corey, when you bring the eleven hundred individuals to the site, you are also doing an onboarding workshop with the craftsmen. 
Yes, sir. Almost daily, as or yes, sometimes more than daily, yes, as they're coming in. Maybe you can share a moment about that. Okay. So you know we do what we call, you know, on the safety, right? And it's more the behavior. I really focus on the behavior because a lot of these uh, we call it towards zero, right? You mm -hmm. hear other people say, "Hey, we got goal zero towards zero." Those right, types, right. it's all zero, right? So we all want a zero. Uh, but as we bring them in. Uh, you know, I focus on the behavior. A lot of them know, hey, look, what a hot work is. A lot of them know, you know, that you know, there's a little differences in each plan of how they run their processes, right? And I, that's the whole purpose of this is, you know, we talked about schedule. We talk about, hey, look, this is your job duty. But you got to stick to the process, mm -hmm. right? There's a process in place. Well, these gentlemen, they've started working on that years before this turnaround even happened. So stick to the process is kind of one of the biggest things that we discuss, but setting that expectation, 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 right? This is what I expect out of you. Well, this is what you're going to expect out of me. Mm -hmm. And so we, you've got to live up to those. And, uh, you know, hey, I'm bringing in 1,100 people to do this job, right? Well, don't promise me a, a three-bedroom when all you're going to deliver is a one in a, a loft. Right. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Gulf Span Industrial, Higginbotham, High Point Insurance Group, H&M Industrial, and Hunter Buildings. For a full list of sponsors, visit www.hasc.com slash sponsorship. So when you guys find gaps in your, your leadership training, when, when you find something that is not quite right, what do you guys do to, to bring those people up to your standards and, and the, the level, the bar that you want you were mentioning you set earlier? Well, one thing, Tommy, is that we do, you know, like, like I'll give you an example is, you know, that leadership workshop that you all have here at the Health and Area Safety Council, right? Mm -hmm. We actually sent some of our leaders uh, to that particular you know, program, mm -hmm. you know, and like we talked about a while ago, some of those leaders that we have, right, you want to learn from them as much as, you, as they learn from you, right? So we get their feedback and, hey, look, how can we make this program better? How can we develop it? You know, how do we do this pre-stuff before they actually get to the plant? Right. Right. So and that's something that um, I would say has been, a, a, you know, something that's been a value. Mm -hmm. We definitely got to have value in what you're actually making them do. Okay. Anything to add to that? Man, I think in this day and age, there's so much technology and so many things that are just kind of coming out overnight that before you know it, there's a next social media platform or another platform for scheduling or a tool for updating or you name it. There's just so many different, another app. I got an app for that, right? Mm -hmm. And so... I think one of the things that we're overlooking is training because think about it. Every time you use something new, do you really have the training for it? I mean, if we think about something like Facebook, has anybody ever actually gone to a Facebook class that holds the app, right? Probably not, right? Maybe it's user-friendly or they depend, they depend on other people to ask those questions. Right. But that's where one of the things, like when we, when we, you know, when we partnered up, by, learn by mistake, right? Right. But I mean, the the leadership course that you guys use here, right? It, it, it covers a lot of what we would say foundational. But I'm I'm thinking is this day and age we're moving so fast, we're developing and we're progressing so fast. Even our next wave of folks that we overlook the the foundational principles. And I think that's an excellent course right there that it can help you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. So last question, guys. I'm going to ask you to put on your thinking hats here. If you had a magic wand and you could fix one thing in turnarounds or you could make one thing better in every single turnaround just by speaking it into being and making it happen, what would it be? And Raj, we're going to start with you. We'll go around the room. What, what is the one thing that is just the bane of your existence that you wish you could fix magically in turnarounds? Would never have a safety incident. Never have a safety incident, right? I and think. how would you go about doing that, though? I mean, what would, what would you, what would, what's something that we could fix that would prevent a safety, a safety incident? Ah. Uh, that's that's a tough one. <laughs> I think um, Corey did touch about this earlier, right? He talked about the behavior part, 
Mm-hmm. Um, that is something that has changed over the years, right? Uh, right, wrong, and different, it did. But I think if we, if that magic wand will try to, you know, change the behavioral aspect where people are a lot more cognizant, mm-hmm. uh, brothers keepers, right, and uh, from even from even our covestro or come from our, if we can make sure that uh, we also help them um, increase the safety awareness and stuff like that. I would say safety would be the number one thing. Some some like hazard recognition, that sort of thing. Just being being aware of your surroundings, right? right? Yep. All right. Tom, what do you think? What would you what would you fix with your magic wand? Well, since uh, Raj went safety, and that, that is always the uncontrollable, is despite all the effort we put in to try to put the right conditions, the right attitudes, reward the right behaviors, it's hard to prevent somebody from losing focus for that split second. Mm-hmm. Something changes, you know, unplanned, unexpected, and someone reacts without quite thinking, and it can get hurt. So that, that's hard to control. That would be wonderful to fix. If I had one more magic wand action like you're talking about, I would love to have a crystal ball mm-hmm. to have x-ray vision of the uh, different equipment we're going to be opening. Be able to predict those discoveries a lot, a lot faster, right? Exactly. My, my, my belief has been over the years that we generally do a very good job preparing the original scope for a turnaround. We have detailed job plans that have been reviewed and approved. We have schedules that have been optimized and bought into by everybody. We have the contractors prepared to do this work. I really believe if we did not have the discoveries, things would just flow like we expected them to. And these discoveries are often what causes the disruption Mm-hmm. You know, additional work coming in that needs to be processed, additional materials you have to go find, and, and so on. So if we had the x-ray vision, you could see inside this equipment, know its condition up front, and, and know really what you need to plan for and minimize that discovery, these turnarounds would go so much smoother and much more predictable. Okay. What about you, Corey? Okay, so it's kind of, look, it's kind of going to touch up on what both of them said, right? We're, we're under a time schedule, right? right? Period. You're under a time schedule. So whenever we do find this discovery work, or say we put a valve in wrong, like a rework or something like that, right? Uh, sometimes with these contractors, it's it's now I might take a shortcut to make up for that. Right? Yeah. So then that goes back to what Raj was saying a while ago, behavior, right? It's behavior, behavior, behavior. And like I said, I can say this all day. I can talk about behavior all day. Uh, but, you know, we want to ensure, like, hey, sticking to the schedule, right? Mm-hmm. Because if you stick to the schedule, maybe that valve ain't put in wrong. Hey, maybe we didn't put the wrong gasket in. Right. So we have that rework. And then as Tom says, hey, we didn't expect we didn't expect that exchanger to be that fouled. So now, now that's putting us behind. And then are we going to how are we gonna make up for that time? Right. How are we gonna make up? It's almost like you guys are walking a tightrope between doing it the right way and not rushing but also having to meet deadlines and yeah. time and, yeah. th- and things like that so how like do you that, not right? get that down to the field how right. do you not say yeah we want these guys that make the big bucks right here to take that heat we don't want the people in the field to know that heat hey right. look, we got to get this back by this time yeah yeah because then then you then you put that even though you're not saying it out loud you're not telling them to hurry up. You're not telling them to rush, but you are putting that internal clock on them, right? They they feel the pressure internally, and so that leads to what Raj said about the behavior, right? And then at that point, maybe they start taking some shortcuts that they wouldn't normally and, take. And they will, right? Yeah. That's just kind of human nature there, Tommy, to kind of take a shortcut. Hey, look, do I really need to put that harness on to do this? I don't know, right? Let's I can do it real quick. Right, right. And, you know. And setting that up, setting all that up first, the more you pre-plan, the more you prepare, the more you're going to be, you know, ready. It's kind of like practice, right? Mm -hmm. Practice, practice. Uh, You know, that leads to game time. Yep. When it gets game time, be ready. That's right. Hey, Seuss, what would you fix? Man, I think they covered it. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard being the last one on that question, right? Well, I'll tell you what, since we're talking about magic, right, and and, and this wand could do anything. He's David Copperfield on the – part-time i I think i think if there was a mechanism in place where you just 
you know, pixie dust it all over the site or everybody when they come on shift where, where there was a way. You'd give me more money? No, no. <laughs> that that would be on its own. That's the second part of the fairy dust. But uh, where it would disable the ability to make a mistake. Yeah. Or it's almost just, you know, if I were to lean back and this chair falls out, it, it just wouldn't let me, you know. Mm -hmm. Just if there was a way that could happen, I think it'd probably cover it all. Yeah. And a lot of that boils down to decision making, like like Raj alluded to. I mean, and and as good as we try to be and to like Corey said, not to get let that pressure get down to the the people who are actually on the tools doing it, they can feel it, right? They 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 sense it. I mean, they've been told from day one this is a forty day turnaround and we're on day 30 and we still got, and got at least all this stuff two laying. weeks left. Yeah, you right? got all this equipment laying on the ground. <laughs> and I look at my watch and so what do you take? Well, it's time for lunch, but they don't take it that way. Exactly, exactly. So you have to be very, very careful uh, as leaders like you guys are is to and how you communicate with those guys, right? Well, I'll tell you what, one of the things, like we talked a lot about leadership. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means making very tough decisions with little or not enough information. Right. And we don't always get it right. That's yeah. that's just the truth, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's one of those things where in the environment of a turnaround, it's a race against the clock, right? But we also, going back to what we said earlier, touching on things that we won't compromise on is safety, right? I mean, at the end of any investigation that might have ever taken place, if you could have looked back and said, what was that pivot point? That you know where that decision went from good or okay to bad to wrong, right? Uh, I don't know. A lot of a lot of those decision points come down to human factors, right? That's exactly right. It, 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 it that's what it boils down to. I I remember, uh, and and to your point, Tom, communication is a lot of it, right? Uh, they did it this way because they thought this, or, or they thought a certain way, or they didn't have all the information or something like that. And, and, and it can really boil down to just lack of communication. But with all that, I would say just to emphasize when it comes to the craftsmen, we try a real concerted effort to make sure the message to them is about safety and quality. Mm -hmm. We're really not talking to them about schedule. Right. And you're right. They may be sensing it, but we don't want that to be their concern. Mm -hmm. It's our concern. It's, it's maybe discussion with their leadership of the contract companies. But when you get out to the crews who are turning wrenches and doing other craft work out in the site, we don't want them worried at all about the time, obviously not about the cost. We right. want their focus on safety and quality. And if we get those right, then the schedule usually falls in line. And if you can get those three of safety, quality, and schedule, your cost is probably also on. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. awesome. Well said. Well, that's a great note to end on then. So uh, thank you guys for joining me for this podcast. I appreciate it. Uh, again, uh, these guys are from Covestro, and I appreciate all y'all's time today to come in and talk to me a little bit about turnarounds, and uh, we'll be signing off. So all those guys out there listening, remember, stay safe. Thank you for that. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Building Safe Workplaces. Be sure to tune in next time for another exciting episode. Till then, stay safe and stay healthy.